we have Dr. Nicole Gugliucci, Nate Latiri, and Anna Morrison here from St. Anselm College um, mm -hmm. to talk to us about radio telescopes and Jupiter. Uh, so whenever you guys are ready, thank you again. Cool. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to get us started with an overall introduction um, and then tag in my colleagues uh, to talk a little bit about uh, their experiences uh, working with this project. Let me see if I can get my slideshow working properly, because that is always a good time on Zoom. Um, oops. Uh, there we go. Nope. Am I screen sharing the screen now? Hang on. Oh, that looks it looked, good. <laughs> it looked good before, Dr. G. It was right? OK, because I'm like, that didn't look like it did before. I'm confused. Uh, OK, let me try that again. Sorry, y'all. Uh, so you should just be seeing the slide on the screen. Um, if that's not the case, you know, yell at us in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a project uh, that we did here at St. Anselm College um, that uh, also makes a good SPS project. Um, and this is uh, using a, a very, 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 very simple version of a radio telescope to detect uh, emissions from the planet Jupiter. Um, so we did this using, there we go, uh, a kit called Radio Jove. So this was developed um, as a NASA like science um, education and sort of citizen science or community science project um, that they send a kit basically of materials and you get to build your own radio telescope. So on the left is the telescope. And you're probably thinking like, that's not a telescope, that doesn't look anything like a telescope. Um, but it's a radio telescope, which is gonna look a little different. And in particular, it's a long wavelength radio telescope. So can't quite see it in that image there, but the telescope itself is a pair of copper wires that are strung up um, on very tall poles and they go between 10 and 20 feet based on where Jupiter is gonna be in the sky. Um, but this is a, a project, I think they hit, they had their 20th anniversary fairly recently. Um, and so there are Radio Jove installations all over the place. Um, and so there's lots of places you can go to talk to people and actually get help about it. Um, so that fits in to our department here at St. Anselm. So we're a smallish department at a very small school. Um, this is on the, on the top is uh, just a, an image from our current observatory. So we have uh, a stash of uh, vintage telescopes on the right um, and a whole stash of our Astronomy 101 telescopes on the left. So if you take Astronomy 101 and there's not a pandemic, you will use an eight inch telescope um, for your lab, which is super fun. Um, we do some other specialized courses on the right is uh, a lab from a remote sensing. Um, and of course, one of the nice things about our, uh, our college environment is having such small classes um, and throwing people at the whiteboard. Again, not at least not under pandemic conditions. Um, so we teamed up with a, a group called the Melia Center, which is the Melia Center for Community Engagement. Um, they do an after school program called Access Academy. Um, and I was particularly involved in writing uh, an NSF noise capacity grant. If you're not familiar with NSF noise grants, um, it's to encourage um, more uh, STEM teachers to join to do secondary education because um, there is a critical, critical shortage, as I'm sure you've heard a million times, uh, of physics teachers in particular, but also math teachers, chemistry teachers in high schools. Um, and perhaps Anna, would you chime in a bit about Access Academy since you worked, you've continued working there? Sure. So Access is really fantastic. It is a program, like Dr. G said, that is geared at um, students in the Manchester high schools and middle schools who are typically underrepresented in higher education. And it works by inviting these students usually to come onto the St. Anselm College campus. And then they take these classes, we usually have about 12 for high school credits, and they're all taught entirely by high school, sorry, by college students. 
So it's a really amazing opportunity to get into a field that you may not be as familiar with. And it was really, really great with this class in particular because it was my first class through Access and I'm a biochemistry student, not a physics student. So it was really, really good to really embrace the learning curve with the students and see how that worked out for us. And it was a really phenomenal experience. Cool. Yeah, so um, we managed to create four new courses out of this grant. Um, what you're seeing here is a, is a picture from Q is for Quantum, which I think Nate co-taught as well, um, which was in the fall. And then uh, we did uh, radios for Jupiter in the spring semester so we could end the semester with a little bit of outdoor stuff um, when it's uh, nicer out. Um, so our, my wonderful, so these are Nate and Anna are two of my four wonderful instructors um, that actually did the lesson plans, ran the course, uh, taught all of the, the high school students what to do. I was just kind of like this shadowy figure in the background that fed them information and, and stuff now and again. Uh, and so my, my challenge was to bring this astronomy and electronics experience. Um, so you guys didn't have any radio astronomy experience. Uh, Nate, I know you've had some electronics experience, um, but you know we, you know I had four instructors that had not uh, done radio astronomy before. And if you've never seen my tattoo, I'm a bit obsessed with radio astronomy. It's what I did my dissertation in. Um, so we met uh, before the students, uh, the high school students started coming, um, and that's when these guys developed um, the lesson plans. Um, we used a lot of material from NASA. Um, and if you're interested, uh, there is a free online textbook called Essential Radio Astronomy, um, which is a really great textbook for upper level undergrad, lower level grad students uh, who are interested in radio astronomy. So I think I threw that at you guys as well. Um, but I don't know if uh, one or both of you wanna talk a little bit about the lesson plans you guys um, used. Sure. So. It was a little bit tricky in the beginning because Lindsay and I, who are on the left, um, like I said before, we were mo mostly um, from biology backgrounds. So we tried to incorporate as much um, learning that, as a lot of the learning that we did in the process of making the lesson plan to the lesson plan itself. So if it took us a little while to understand a certain concept, we made sure to touch on that. And it was really great to have Nate and Derek there who are on the right there as well because they understood the concepts and it was really, really great to see how like, us learning and them understanding met in the middle to create an environment that was really conducive to helping the high schoolers. And based on that combined amount of knowledge, we did a lot of small group work. So one of our best days was when we divided up the group into teams and each of them focused on a different type of wavelength and they had the whole period, more or less, to research it and come up with different types of facts and things that they'd like to present to the class. And it was really, really amazing to see the students work together, exactly, <laughs> work together and um, put in this amazing effort and then use that knowledge that they gained to teach their fellow classmates about what they had learned. And I think the small group element is really what made this class so special because we really took advantage of each student being taught something a little bit different and then using that student's knowledge so that they could help their fellow classmates and everyone got a really holistic experience. It was very interesting developing lesson plans considering none of us really had that much experience with it. I think Lindsay, was she also a... Um, education major as well I think she was Lindsay was the one of you that was a secondary education major but she had kind of just started yeah it was very interesting though but it was nice to collaborate with all the different disciplines we had represented there because we all had different perspectives and we were able to capitalize on that to you know work towards those lesson plans from everyone contributing a different idea from a different perspective 
Yeah, that was that was really cool. Um, yeah, the, the goal was to get uh, students who hadn't ever done, you know, formal or, or, or I don't know what I'm saying, you know, any kind of teacher training um, and at least one in the group uh, who did. So Lindsay was the secondary education major as well as biology, I think, or natural sciences. Um, and uh, so I know she brought the experience of like, okay, here's a little bit of how, you know, you think about putting together a lesson plan. Um, again, this is a great project in part because NASA um, provides lesson plans along with it. Um, and it covers the whole range of like, what are radio waves to, you know, what's creating these things on Jupiter, um, as well as a little bit about uh, building the project itself. In fact, we had so much material, we only had, we had to like pick and choose what we were actually gonna be able to, to focus on. Um, so we had a group of, 17 high school students, 16 or 17 high school students, which is a fairly large group um, for a course like this. And you're building one telescope. We have one telescope kit. Um, and so we had to figure out kind of had how to break that up into um, different segments. Um, so with the four instructors, and you guys also had a couple of volunteers um, in the room with you as well, who were also St. Age, Col St. Age College students um, to help you out. Um, the, you know, one of the most obvious pieces of it is the, the mast, the huge PVC masts. Um, so for our location and time and all of that stuff, we needed 20 foot long PVC masts. So I went to Home Depot and bought 10 foot long PVCs. Um, pro tip, <laughs> do not squish them lengthwise in your car and lean them against the windshield because Believe it or not, it can crack your windshield just by the amount of time that it is putting pressure on your windshield. Uh, so that was a mistake that I paid for. Um, but uh, you know, most of the materials, it, it, from what uh, besides what comes in the kit, um, actually you can get at you know a local hardware store. So there were many many trips to Home Depot and Lowe's um, to get pieces, having peop and then having the students cut and measure. Um, well, measure, excuse me, then cut um, and drill holes and do all that fun stuff um, for the masts. Unfortunately for us, that was also the weakest point um, as it uh, would succumb to windstorms a couple times initially. Uh, and after about a year, uh, we've had to take it down because the PVC has been uh, not holding up on a what's a particularly windy spot. Um, so that's something we get to work on a bit more. Um, Nate, you want to tell us a little bit about the antenna? Sure. So the antenna was a die. There was two dipole antennas. I forget the words. I think it's a two dipole antenna. So basically, it was four sections of copper wire with the insulator in between, and then at the end, there was an insulator and it was attached to the PVC pipe. These were connected at the base of the telescope with a coaxial cable. And that coaxial cable will actually feed into the receiver to collect the data. Uh, for phasing and getting the right measurements, the height and length of each of the copper wires was very important. Also make sure everything was assembled correctly. Um, I have a very good tip. If any of you guys ever decide to do this project, which I really hope you do, it was a great experience. Make sure your soldering iron is really hot on the coaxial cable because the braided cable took me about 20 minutes to heat it up. It was quite the experience, but lesson learned there. Pro tip for everyone. Uh, did you learn anything else about uh, measuring and cutting from, from the antenna? Uh, I think that was the biggest lesson learned in this situation for me. Thankfully, I've had prior building experience. Mm -hmm. So I've already learned the lessons of measure twice, cut once, keep your lines. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think we we almost had an issue where we had to track down some more copper wire. Uh, thankfully, copper wire is super cheap. Um, but yeah, you want to, especially because now you're in groups, you have, you know, you're directing a group of, I forget how many were in each group, like four, maybe five, three to five, I guess, depending on the day. Um, uh, you know, keeping track of who's doing the measuring and all that stuff um, so that you don't cut your wire and find, oops, I've got two pieces that are too short. 
um, and run into problems there. Um, what was nice about these groups also is that they rotated. So um, those first two are the like front end hardware groups. Um, the next two groups talk a little bit more about the signal when it comes through. Um, and so students got to be in one of each type of group. Um, so they spent a little bit of time in a hardware group, either the mast or the antenna, and a little bit of time in, in one of the next couple groups. Um, and Anna, I think the receiver, was that you? You did the receiver? You wanna talk about that some? Sure, so the way that I tried to do this was um, to have the goal anyway, was to try to get the students to be able to put it together all on their own and be able to calibrate it completely without my interference. So what we did is I initially read through the guidebook and everything that was provided by NASA. And then we kind of turned it into a game. So the first day we identified all the components and talked about why it's important to have the speakers in a certain location and how it would get plugged into the computer, and what types of applications you would use in order to get the data and all the important elements of that. And then after the students had learned about each of the elements, we unplugged everything and then had each of them take a turn putting everything back together. And if something went wrong, we would have other students step in and kind of help them out, lend a hand. And by the end of I think the first two weeks, they were, under, they were able to put the whole thing together in under 60 seconds, which was really impressive because I don't think any of us thought that it would go that fast, but the students really, really were interested in learning. And as soon as they got a little taste of it, they really ran with it. So it was really phenomenal to see how invested they were in the success of this project. Yeah, that's a, a lesson I learned in grad school doing instrumentation uh, is you want to know what you're doing when you're in a, a more controlled environment. So for here, it was the lab uh, before you go outside to the observatory to set it up for the first time to actually use it. Um, and so that was a, a great way of doing that. Um, this uh, receiver, um, we bought one that was pre-built. Um, you can also buy, a, buy the kit so that you could build your own receiver, do all the soldering on the circuit board. We did not have nearly enough time to do that part of the project. Um, but uh, some folks at my alma mater, like Homing College over in zone three, uh, have been working with the Radio Jove um, for even longer. And uh, they had one that was pre-made and one that they made themselves and the one they made themselves came out better. So it can be a really good experience to, to also go through building your own receiver. Um, and for all that I, I rail against the fact that radio waves are not sound, that they're light, um, you've got speakers. You've actually got speakers attached to this receiver as well so that you can, um, so that the signal is trans translated into sound um, so that you can hear basically static, right? I mean, it's basically just static, either louder or lower static, but that gives it a really visceral experience um, for people who were experiencing radio astronomy for the first time. Um, and the fourth group had to learn how to deal with the data when it came out, uh, came out the back. Um, so there's software um, that you can, I think there's a trial version, but you can purchase the software. It all runs on Windows. I'm not a Windows person. I, I, I struggle with that, um, but this software has been developed um, specifically for uh, a lot of citizen science, amateur radio astronomy use. Um, and so what they looked at, because there is a database of, of, of all these Radio Jove users, um, people post, put their data in a public repository. So we're, we're able to grab data from other sites and have them work with that and look for um, either Jupiter emissions or solar flares and things like that in other people that had been already marked in other people's data. In fact, as I was planning this course, this was my fail safe in case at the end of the semester, we either didn't finish building it or built it and it didn't work. Um, two of which are, you know, potentially likely possibilities. And I didn't want the high school students to leave not having, you know, seen any data, um, but uh, things actually worked out super well for us. So once the students put these together, um, and we took a whole Saturday uh, to deploy the antenna. So we didn't have the high school students present for that because uh, their classes were usually like, uh, I forget, an hour and a half to something like that, two hours on a Tuesday. 
Um, and uh, Anna, I don't remember how long we were out there, but I remember, I think I got you guys dinner at the pub because we were out so long. I don't, I don't remember entirely. Yeah, I want to say we started around like 10 or 11 in the morning yeah. and we didn't finish until it was quite dark dinner. out so yeah yeah <laughs> <the dinner. laughs> yeah so um we were able to to put these up construct um the antenna and actually get um first light uh and the first light graph is rather interesting um because it is uh on the bottom is the time so it's you know a standard universal time uh we, this is calibrated as Anna described. So this is set with a calibrator source that has a particular brightness temperature. Um, and so what you see, uh, first off, you may notice there's a lot of spikes. Um, this is primarily, you know, radio frequency interference. It's the radio astronomer's version of light pollution. Um, you know, where, you know, kind of, it's kind of on the edge of Manchester, which is a city of 100,000 people. So uh, it's expected that you're going to see a lot of human made interference. But underneath that, you see that there's this sloping curve that's actually picking up um, the background from the galaxy. So when the Milky Way is most overhead, or at least in the beam or, or the location that this telescope sees the most, um, you have it's higher. And when the Milky Way moves out of that, it's actually a little bit lower. So even though it looks like a lot of human made interference, um, there's actually this, this um, galactic background that's happening. Uh, and then this fabulous thing happens um, the, at 1230. Uh, so our first attempt at making four 20 foot poles upright uh, failed uh, within, you know, like less than 24 hours. Uh, so those are the two instances where the antenna <laughs> different poles fell um, because the mounting mechanism that I had kind of come up with was pretty terrible. Um, but thankfully, I have colleagues who are much better at things and who have actually installed fences before. Um, so we were able to get a, a a much sturdier way of getting them up. And then I think Nate, you were involved in rushing to get it back up in time for the, the students to come visit. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have anything on that from bringing them out here. Yeah, they were super, super excited just to see everything that they'd worked on, like all stood up. And it was really cute at the end because each of them went and signed one of the poles which was really, really nice just to see them put their mark on something so important that they got to work on. Yeah. It was very gratifying to see because I feel like for a lot of them, this was their first time building something and getting to see it work. It's always a great experience. You know, the project's finally done, it works. And it was great for them to experience that. Awesome, yeah. So my computer is frozen. So I don't know if y'all can hear me. Uh oh. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I can't click slides and everything looks frozen for me. Um, I'm going to try and escape out for a sec. Um, I think it's trying to back up to Time Machine, which is messing me up. Sorry, I should have turned that off. Uh, let's try that again. Play from current. Oops, I'm going to go back one. Um, so, one thing that they did manage to detect is a solar flare. And I would not have been able to find uh, this solar flare amidst all of the uh, human made interference that we had there um, without a little help. Um, so again, being a part of the Radio Jove um, users email list, a uh, bunch of people, you know, chimed in, hey, did you see this? Did you see this? So we knew exactly what time to zoom in on. And I think this was like right before their class, their last class. So they got to see, they actually detected an astronomical phenomenon, a real solar flare um, uh, before being able to give their presentation. Um, and then there was uh, a, 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 um, an event spotted from Jupiter according to some of the other users. And we tried looking for it, um, thinking it might be something here, but uh, I think after the fact, we, we realized it was just kind of noise. Um, so we had a maybe Jupiter, but we definitely had uh, a solar flare. And so uh, at the end of Access, um, they are able to give this presentation to their peers. Um, I think they invite people from the high school district um, and all kinds of stuff like that so that they can actually present. Um, and Anna, I remember you were coaching the two 
the two girls who were doing the presentation. Yep, so uh, myself and Lindsay, I believe, um, work with two of the students who had volunteered to speak and we gave them a very brief script, but they did a phenomenal job. Like, they just talked about how their experience went and the things that they had learned. And here you can see one of the students pointing to the screen and explaining to all of her friends and her twin sister who was also in the audience, how amazing um, it was to see the final result of the project that they worked so hard on. Yeah, so they made these little boards. Um, I think there were a couple of display boards um, before the presentation as well um, that showed kind of what they learned about light in those early activities. Um, and then, you know, some of the things they did in building this telescope um, and putting it up. Um, so it was a, it was for me, it was a learning experience. I've, I've never built one of these at, at this wavelength before. Um, I know for you guys, it was a learning experience um, in terms of, uh, doing radio astronomy first time, but also teaching, um, I think for the first time. Uh, and then of course, for these students, um, some of the comments were like, we, I never knew astronomy was a thing you could do, a thing you could be, and I'm really into it. So um, it was really cool for that. I'm gonna put up a list of links. Um, most useful, I think at the top is the Radio Jove uh, website where you can get all the materials. Um, and then just a little bit from, from our local Amelia um, Center for Community Engagement, our physics department, um, and how you can reach me. Um, but I'd like to get maybe some last thoughts from Nate and Anna um, on what it was like as a teaching experience or, or yeah, as a teaching or outreach experience. I think as a teaching experience, it was really, really empowering. And just to see how well, even as a, a first time um, person in this experience, like I had never taught anything and going into that first lesson that we did as a class was really, really nerve wracking. But just to see how cooperative the students were with the process and how kind and determined that they were to see this project through was really incredible. And I'm so, so glad that this was my first experience with Access because it was truly amazing. This was my second experience with Access. I helped co-teach uh, QS for Quantum the semester before. It was certainly interesting teaching as a physics student or rather engineering student, because I had never even considered teaching as a career, to be honest. I really didn't think I was that into it, but it really was a good experience. It was gratifying. The students were an absolutely phenomenal group of students and it was very, gratifying again to see them develop and learn. And I would suggest um, for SPS chapters considering this, um, we do we tend to do a lot of outreach events that are one off events um, that you know bring a whole bunch of people in, do a whole bunch of demos. But um, another type way of way of doing outreach uh, involves having a smaller group that you meet with regularly. Um, this was a model that uh, we used. To, I was a grad student at University of Virginia. There's a group called Dark Skies Bright Kids um, that uh, does an after school astronomy program for elementary school kids. And so you you reach you have a reach of less people over the course of a semester, say, um, but you get to build that relationship if you have that weekly or bi-weekly interaction with them. And I think this project, being that it has so many stages, um, if you do choose to use it for outreach, it's really good for one of those like long-term um, kind of relationship building projects. Um, and plus it's cool and super fun. Uh, I said, I know, I know of at least one other SVS chapter that uh, is active with this project. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited uh, to hear about more that might be working on it. Uh, that is all we have on this. And I think we are more than happy to take questions. Um, I, what was I gonna do? I was gonna stop screen sharing. Um, oh, did, I, did I stop screen sharing? <laughs> I can't You're good. tell. Okay. I'm just gonna <laughs> pop on and say, you guys can put your, uh, questions in the Q&A feature on the toolbox at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then I also had a question to start us off while people get us uh, get their questions in. Do you guys have any favorite stories from working with the high schoolers during this like period of time? 
I'll let you guys go. You did most of the teaching. Okay. Um, I think my favorite was, I want to say it was the first or the second class when we took on this little antenna. It looks just like the antenna you'd have at the top of your house. And um, the students got to hold it and we kind of explained what it does and why it's important to what we're doing. And just seeing like, the students hold it over their heads and be so excited to just kind of run around and have fun with it was really great because we had no idea how we were going to do in terms of like making this material relatable to them. And just seeing that so early on was really, really great. I think we uh, have a picture with that one as well. It was the class with the uh, satellite dish as an antenna, I believe. Um, that one, I agree, was a really good experience. I also quite enjoyed the uh, class period where we blocked a radio with a colander. We uh, made the Faraday cage around it with the colander and the kids were all so shocked to see that that worked. And I thought that was a really fun experience. We got to pull out all my favorite um, radio demos that I've done over the years for different groups. Throw them all at, at you guys. Um, yeah, so the the calendar demo, uh, it's not easy to find anymore, but you can still find battery powered AM FM radio, like handheld radios um, that you can do this experiment with. Um, using a colander, which I no longer use for food. I just, just use for this now. Um, and you can see through it. You can see through that mesh, but it blocks um, the radio waves. And you can even prove it's the radio waves and not sound by playing an, you know, playing a, a song on your phone and throwing your phone under there. Um, as long as it's one that you've downloaded, you're not streaming um, to, to show that, you know, sounds coming through, but you know, it's the difference is the radio waves coming through. Um, and yeah, the one that I was just screen sharing, uh, it literally was a satellite TV dish taken from someone's roof. Um, it's, uh, it's a little project called the Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. Um, so you can kind of Google that phrase and you'll see um, this is this is even smaller and cheaper and quicker than putting up a whole radio Joe system. And it's more of a demonstrator than something you can take measurements with. Um, although some people actually have built back ends that they can take measurements with. Um, but I use it as a demonstrator. Um, and it is really, really easy to go on Craigslist and just pick up. People will just give you their dish network TV dishes for free because they're still around. Um, and yeah, I stick a receiver, stick a, you know, a signal meter on that. Uh, and you can tell the difference between the sun and the sky and the sun and the sky and the ground and the sun and the sky. And I think that was all you guys could see, but it was, uh, it was really great to see that in the beginning. Thank you guys for sharing those stories. I love that. <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, otherwise I think we're good, but let's wait a couple uh, minute or two to see. <laughs> Some people might take a while to, it might take a second to type it in. <laughs> yeah. Um, doo, doo, doo. So I put the link and I didn't realize I only sent it to panelists. So thank you for fixing that. <laughs> not <a problem>. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very useful. See if I can find it, something itty bitty. Um, and then everybody, this is recorded. So if you want to share it with anybody, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel later too. So, and I'll make sure the link for Radio Jove is in the description of the YouTube as well. Ooh, hang on, there's a good one. Uh, I'm going to put this here because this is a link in the, I'm going to put this link in the chat, hopefully to everybody this time. Um, it's a little bit about the itty bitty radio telescope um, from, um, uh, the Night Sky Network. Uh, Sue Ann Heatherly does outreach at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. Uh, awesome place, awesome woman. Um, so she did some uh, uh, tele or like webinars on it. So you can kind of check out the recording there. Uh, ooh, we have a couple questions. Um, uh, and I might pop this over to, to Nate and Anna um, and Nate in particular, uh, formerly being an SPS officer, what's the biggest piece of advice you would offer to a chapter who would like to start? Oh, I didn't see that question. It's in like yeah. starting the SPS chapter or starting this project? I think starting the, this project. 
if a chapter wants to start this project. Make sure you have everything planned out ahead of time, know where you're going to put it, because there are some calculations that go into, you know, how wide your arc's going to be, how to orient the telescope. Make sure you're prepared, make sure you have all your materials, just like any other project. Make sure you know who's going to do it. Um, I would highly recommend if you want it to be a more permanent setup, think of better ways than PVC pipe and zip ties to construct it. Honestly, if you're really in it for the long term, maybe wooden post if you can get post that long and have cross beams made of cables, that would definitely work better. You want to come back and rebuild it? <laughs> I mean, I could. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Anna. Uh, going off of that as well, just when you are getting ready to assemble your telescope, just make sure that the ground is also um, able to withstand the masts and you're able to actually dig because we had some big problems just trying to get the posts into the ground because it took so, so long, but it was good. The, good, the end result was good. <laughs> You know, after all that, so I recently took it down, um, and two of them I could I are still out there because I couldn't pull it out of the ground. <laughs> so they're like frozen and solidified. Yeah, we used we had a we we happen to have a spot by our you know our observatories, big big open field owned by the college. Um, you may want to opt to have a um, more mobile one, in which case the PVC would be fine and actually would probably be easiest. Um, if you didn't have a permanent spot for it, um, you wanted to do some observations and then take it back down, um, might be a, a good way as well. Um, we have a question that doesn't seem steerable. Do you know from your setup where you're pointing or your beam with when receiving? Which is a really great question. I think Nate just touched on that a little bit. Um, if you wanna mention. Yeah, so on the website, actually, it shows you all the calculations you need. So going off memory, the length of the dipoles, as well as the orientation, will get your, your direction as well as your arc length. So adjusting those will adjust the direction and your beam width to get a very accurate view. But as far as live steering, this setup is not able to do that unless you physically pick it up, move it, or cut the copper cables shorter or longer yeah yeah so they give you so it's i don't remember what the beam width sizes um but you could see it on a you know a sky map it's it's a very large tens of degree beam um that we're talking about and based on yeah so so based on the height of the poles um because the ground is part of your antenna uh and um particularly that cable in between the two so it's a phase dipole um, array. So changing the length of that um, of that wire is what um, between the two dipoles is what tells you how far up you're going to be uh, pointing basically. Uh, and you want to set it to where um, Jupiter is going to be for you. Uh, and they have a whole bunch of tables of, you know, over the next however many years and possibly decades, um, what, where is the best place based on your location for Jupiter? And, you know, for us, I think Jupiter was as far, fairly far low in the Southern sky for us um, when we were looking at it. And so, uh, you know, so we had it facing South um, and then the 20 foot, I, I don't remember what the length between the dipoles was, but we did need the 20 foot because uh, there's also a 10 foot and 15 foot option, but we did do the 20 foot tall option. Um, but you don't have to change it, you know, more than I think, you know, every couple of years or so, um, if you have a permanent installation again, um, because that beam is massive. Um, and so Jupiter's not moving that much, but you are tracking it over time as it goes through um, the beam. And there is a model of the beam in one of the software packages. Um, that you could probably dig into a little more if you wanted to know uh, a little bit better because you know obviously your flux is going to depend on where in the beam it's looking at um, but yeah it's not steerable uh, it's it's one big blob of the sky and you are watching the sky go through uh, your blob cool other questions 
I have actually used the term blob in scientific papers. Not to describe antenna beams, but I have used it. Sometimes it just fits, you know? <laughs> it just fits, yeah. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Um, we do have a great answer thank you in the chat though, so. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, so is there anything else you guys would like to share? There's a, a one just popped up. Uh, how much does a setup like this cost? Um, so they have they list the kit prices on um, the website. Um, I feel like it was between two and 300. Once you included all of the costs um, of the going back and forth to uh, Home Depot and or Lowe's uh, and all the material we got there, I, I, I know we set aside $500 per course for access academy course um i think we even may have included the software in that so you know order of magnitude <laughs> it's going to be around 500. but again we we had we had that money from an nsf grant so we probably threw more money than you you probably could do it on on cheaper Are there any other questions? Feel free to put them in the Q&A. There's always a lot of waiting with this new internet everything. <laughs> I want to make better sure better than being deluged. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and missing things. Going back, I think a lot of our problems with the PVC post and digging them in might have been a uniquely New Hampshire problem. I know digging up fence posts at home in Virginia was pretty easy, but in New Hampshire, the minute the shovel touches the ground, you hit a rock. You took geology. Tell us more about that. Uh, someone in the audience here knows my grade in geology, and he knows I did not do well. We just, we just blame it on granite, right? Uh, just blame it on granite. Okay. Yeah, the, the instructions come with um, a way to do it using metal poles as well, which I find blows my mind slightly considering that the metal is also conductive um, and what that would do to the beam pattern. But uh, since we were, you know, trying to work with materials that we could use with high school students, we stuck to the PVC. The high school students were not allowed to solder or use the power drill because we didn't have endurance for that. Um, so you guys, you guys got to do the that fun stuff. Awesome. Um, is there anything else you guys would like to share before we close it up? <laughs> Either of you guys want to go? I can close up. All you, Dr. G. <laughs> okay. Um, no. Uh, yeah. I. This is really exciting for me because it get it let me bring together. Um, you know, education and radio astronomy in a way um, that was new for me. Um, I think again, this is going to, this is this is a unique project for um, an astronomy outreach project. Usually, you know, we bring our visual telescopes out, and you can do amazing projects with that. Um, look, you look up a Galileo scope. That's a kit where you can make um, optical, small optical telescopes. I've done that with groups of, of students before. Um, but getting this into this, it's a subject that you don't usually throw at people in the beginning at astronomy. Um, but I think it, uh, you know, radio waves are, you know, part of our everyday lives. And so it's cool to introduce that new way of, of seeing things. Um, and just the efficacy, being able to show uh, your own efficacy at building something from, you know, over the course of a semester is uh, really important too. Um, but yeah, I'm the zone one counselor. If you guys have any questions, so it's pretty easy to find my contact info. <laughs> Yes, uh, you can find Nicole's contact info on um, our website, uh, the governance on the governance page. Um, but again, thank you, Nate, Anna, and Nicole. I really, we all really appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule to do this with us. Um, and we hope that you have a great day and all the attendees have a great day. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.